Hey, welcome to the Kingdoms Podcast. My name is Luke and I host this with my buddy, Matt Ma. And our goal is to empower you to discover how your faith impacts culture for God's kingdom. To do that, we're sitting down with different men and women from all kinds of disciplines to uncover how they, through their ambitions and vocational skill set, make a difference in the lives of those around them. And so if this is helpful to you, we'd love it if you could like it, share it, and subscribe. In the meantime, enjoy today's episode. Welcome today. We are with Carolyn Weber, who has served as faculty at Oxford University, Seattle University, University of San Francisco, and Westmont College. Uh, she was the first female to be the Dean of St. Peter's College at Oxford, which you can read about in her new book, Sex in the City of God. Uh, she currently teaches at Heritage College and Seminary and Brescia University College in Canada. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. This is a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, we're so excited for the conversation and uh, just being able to touch on your book a bit. Um, be, but before we get into that, could you take a few moments to sort of paint a picture of your life, your background, uh, maybe even your current work? And uh, if you want to get into something intriguing that maybe people don't know about you, we would love that. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> Go for it. I don't know. I'm fairly, fairly boring, but um, I grew up in, in just outside London, Ontario, Canada. I was born in Toronto and then I grew up in a little place, Lambeth, uh, and went to school in London. And um, I grew up with, I, I would say, a very sort of median average type of family um, mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, my parents were loosely Catholic, didn't really grow up with any kind of faith. Um, they eventually were separated and divorced. Um, my mom essentially raised us as a single mom. Um, my dad was in and out of my life. He had some mental illness. He had some um, aggressive behaviors, but he was also a very brilliant person. Um, so I, I, and I have a very loving older brother, a very loving and sweet younger sister. I was the middle child spent a lot of my childhood and teenage years really enjoying school, enjoying sports, cheerleading, all that sort of stuff, but um, but also working a lot of jobs, trying to help my family survive, um, trying to navigate some of the alcoholism from my mom as well as a single mom raising us with a lot, I think, on her plate. Mm -hmm. So a kind of a mix of everything, a lot of joy and happiness and fun and and loving and and yet also, you know, worries and concerns and stressors like anyone else, but no frame of reference for faith at all. And I would have said actually to Matt, probably by the time I went to college, my undergraduate, for sure, I was, I, I would have defined myself as agnostic, not atheist, because I couldn't disprove God. Uh, but I certainly wasn't going to trust in a father, a heavenly father, especially mm -hmm. when, you know, an earthly father hadn't been that trustworthy for me. So I ended up going to Western University uh, in London, Canada. And then from there, I studied and, and went on to uh, on a Commonwealth scholarship to study at Oxford University. And it was in my first year at Oxford University where there was a kind of a big combination of things that happened. But I started meeting Christians. I was really starting to think about the Christian faith after researching other faiths and religions for my um, master's work at the time anyway. But I had been long dealing with this sort of sense of longing and wondering what more there was to life. And uh, I eventually became a Christian in my graduate studies. Mm. So I was a later convert. I was sort of my early 20s when I became a Christian in graduate school. And so I came from an unbelieving background, a lot of unbelieving friends. Um, and then I sort of had these two worlds um, to navigate. So I would have defined, uh, I would have defined my home as loving enough to get by, but broken enough not to deserve God's attention. Mm. It's kind of how I felt my family was. And, uh, and so that was in a nutshell, sort of how I, how I grew up. Um, and uh, not really a lot of antagonism in my home towards the faith, but not really a lot of um, proof or evidence or interest in it either. Right. Yeah, wow, mm -hmm. fair enough. And you've touched on faith just in, in what you've mentioned, and especially that initial discovery of faith that, mm -hmm. well, in your graduate studies. Mm -hmm. Could you take us deeper into that? Because, I mean, we live in a, a time in, in history where one of the real concerns in the church is young people who grow up in the church, and then when they're in college or graduate studies, walk away from their faith. So for sure. you to, to do the opposite Absolutely. is 
well as encouraging, but also also pretty intriguing. So what what did that look like as your heart was in a new way pointed towards discovering Christ? Who were the people or the what were the experiences uh, that led to that conversion? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Luke, because I find that, uh, you know, I think God knows all of our weaknesses, our Achilles heels, and uses our gifts and our talents and our strengths, too. Yeah. I loved reading. I loved literature. That's what I went on to study. I'd always loved learning. I was a bit of a book geek, um, <clears throat> and I I read all the time, and yet I'm a perfect example of someone who had gone through, you know, 20 years of the public school system and had never cracked open a Bible. I had wow. never been exposed to it, never really, you know, other than the odd verse or, or here or there, remembering going to church a little bit with my grandparents, but that was in Hungarian, you know? <laughs> you know, you know, that sort of thing. So by the time I got to college, actually, I started reading the Bible, um, even just as a historical text, uh, you know, for literature and that too. But when I, I, when I started to read it more seriously, just thinking, okay, first of all, these Christians I, were meet, I was meeting were intriguing, but they were also really irritating. And so I initially read the Bible cover to cover just to see how I could poke holes in their argument. Hmm. Um, I really expected the Bible to be completely bizarre and not make any sense. And, um, you know, and I began to realize actually that it was really an amazing work. You couldn't make this stuff up. And also as a literature person, I was really drawn to how it was such a um, a holistic story with this plan that, um, you know, that fully unraveled from Genesis to Revelation. It was incredible. There was this story that we were all a part of, and I wasn't expecting that. I was really expecting to read it and and sort of wahaha, put it down, <laughs> put people down with it. And I mean, they really have to have Holy Bible on the cover, you know, in electric lights, because it's actually really pretty powerful. And once you start to read this stuff, it's hard to unread it. And um, even the quirky stuff. And, uh, and I began to realize like, wow, this is really interesting. This is really powerful. And that the people I knew who were self-proclaimed atheists or whatnot were driving around with the Darwin, you know, bumper stickers or whatnot on their cars, swallowing the cheese, you know, with the cheeses fish. And they probably had never cracked a Bible open. So I found it really interesting to just read about it and think about it for myself. And then as I started to meet more Christians who um, really represented their faith, it's not that they were perfect or heavy handed or holier than now, but they answered my questions or they thought through them with me if, mm. if they didn't have the answers. Um, they really had something I wanted. As I was getting to know them and I, I realized that they had this this joy and this eternal perspective and, and something that was more meaningful to their lives. And I realized that I had been longing for this for quite some time, um, but that they were walking their, their talk and, and they had this kind of depth and this, you could go deep or shallow with them, you know, anywhere there was this sort of mm. relief of being in truth. And I had never experienced fellowship. I'd never been part of a church. I didn't know what it was like to pray with somebody. Um, and it just opened this whole other world to me where I began to realize, wow, there's another way of being in the world. Yeah. And uh, I kicked against it and kicked against it because it's also very fearful and, um, and you're no longer in control. And I had certainly tried, I had certainly gotten as far as I had gotten in life by pulling my bootstraps up, you know, mm. I'm going to survive and I'm going to be, you know, able to get the scholarship and I'm going to work these jobs and I'm going to be able to get these grades and everything had been through my dependence on myself and self-reliance and, and the notion of grace just completely freaked me out. And yet I had to admit that it was far more powerful than karma. Mm. <laughs> Trump karma. I, that the truth. <laughs> I was in real trouble if, there, if karma ruled the universe. And, um, and that it was really ringing true, um, even in light of everything else I had read and even these other religions and mythologies I was looking at academically. So I had this kind of academic and intellectual wrangling and all of these things that I was reading and looking at. And I also had these friends or people I knew that were embodying their faith. And that was really speaking to me as well. Yeah. I so appreciate how you've articulated that because I think something I value a lot as, as a Christian <laughs> and something I think the world is, is looking for when it's paying attention to the church is people who, when they say, I believe this about Jesus, are are embodying it in a way that makes people want to belong to that. You know what I'm saying? That like, yeah. people see that yeah. and say like, wow, I I, I want that to be true. And, and I, I want to be a, a part of that. Um, that's been super formative, even in my own journey, when I think about 
uh, the people that influenced me the most in following Jesus weren't necessarily the people who could uh, proclaim that the best, but the people who lived it out in a way that I was like, wow, I so badly, I want to belong to that reality. I want to have that eternal perspective. I want to have that, right. that immersion in grace, which, yeah, which you talked about. So yeah, that's, that's so well put. And you write in the sex and the city of God that personal desires are not mm -hmm. at the heart of intimacy, rather selfless acts of love are. Realizing that we are part of something bigger than ourselves reorients us towards what really matters. And so how might personal desires and sometimes our, our pursuit of personal desires fail to make good on, on the promises they offer us when we choose to say, to focus on me instead of considering how we can be a part of maybe what God is doing on a broader level or our community or something beyond ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that selflessness without again being preachy, it's just so central to our relationship to God. And one of the reasons I wrote this book was I really wanted to explore our relationship to relationships, mm -hmm. um, not just intimate relationships, but all relationships. I think mm -hmm. we tend to forget that we are built for relationship and we're made in relationship and we are our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper. And, you know, and, um, and that's why I was really drawn to Augustine. You know, if you told me I was ever going to write a book with the word sex in its title, I would never would have believed it <laughs> <laughs> as a literature professor and, you know, a homeschooling mom. And, a, you know, I, I, I didn't intend for it to be a salacious title, but I was really looking at, well, what happens when we look at our relationships and particularly intimate ones and intimate mm. choices as well as um you know which sort of city we belong to mm. um you know we've got sex in the city which is the hbo show and the and kind of the media and cultural representation of how we should be approaching relationships and yet if we think about also the city of god as augustine was looking at it and again not to be heavy heavy handed but you know where is your citizenship lie do you live in the city of god um, the eternal where relationships have, have meaning and repercussions and we live in responsibility to ourselves as temples of God and to others um, in terms of how God loves them too um, and the consequences of our choices on others or are you living in the city of man which is the temporal and in which there isn't larger meaning and Augustine says you know they're called from peace but they have two very different teleological ends, mm -hmm. you know, for two very different purposes and two very different ways of understanding ourselves in relationship. And um, I think in a city of man, relationships can be disposable. Responsibility has limitations as far as they make us happy or, or fulfill a need quickly or whatever, um, or they're not inconvenient. But in the city of God, if that's where your citizenship lies, your relationship to relationship is profoundly different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that changes all our relationships. Um, and so I think that that's what I was trying to explore more in this, in this book was thinking about that in all of our relationships, especially our intimate ones, but in all the ways that we, um, you know, by choosing to God love, to love God first and ordering our loves, as Augustine says as well, and following that first commandment first, then the other ways that we love fall into place and we know how better to love. Yeah. Oh, well said. And there's, especially as, you know, someone as a young adult, but also as someone who serves youth and young adults, uh, there is so much to be said in that vein of thinking uh, for galvanizing purpose in young people, especially I really in anybody uh, to say like, there's, there's purpose, there's significance in your relationships in you seeing yourself as a part of something bigger than just you and your own interests or your own desires uh, that you have a role to play in the way community or church uh, or even, yeah, intimate, close, loving relationships are formed in shape that you have the potential to, to give something of yourself to someone to see them thrive in some really significant ways. So, yeah, beautifully put and really appreciate and resonate with our, how you articulated that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, too, in, in our relationships, especially as young persons, um, often we can set our desire for like such a such a high standard uh, that we almost require something of like infinite magnitude from a creature uh, when only God can mm. fulfill that. And, and we almost, absolutely, um, we almost like ruin what we've engaged in before we get to it. Uh, our, our 
yeah, the, the promises mm. of promiscuity uh, will never be fulfilled um, in promiscuity. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I mm-hmm. remember in, in, in high school, uh, just having mm-hmm. uh, friends who, uh, particularly female friends when I was in high school, uh, who would say something along the lines of that right now, they're just dating Jesus. And I didn't get that sense from your book. I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't get the sense that when you spoke of your relationship to the bridegroom, especially when you were single, um, I didn't get the sense mm-hmm. that you were just like flippantly dating Jesus, but there was some deep longing that the infinite God of the universe was satisfying in those times of longing. Can you speak to that? Yeah, to people who would use that kind of phrase, but I think it's those kind of phrases when Christians use them among themselves that make un- non-believers on the outside feel really creeped out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because, it, you know, it's a very creepy thing. Even to call like uh, Jesus the bridegroom can seem really creepy, but we're looking at really deeply symbolic, symbolic language. I wouldn't necessarily call it dating Jesus because, you know, God knows what's in man and we're going to be doomed if we expect anyone to fill our emotional bucket. Hmm. Our emotional buckets always have a hole in the bottom and or your fiance or your roommate or your friend or whatever to fill that bucket. Um, Only God can do that. Hmm. But what I what I was interested in is that, you know, especially in marriage, it's the only relationship where you have taken an oath. Uh, any other relationship, you haven't taken an oath to love someone. You know, you have your child and you love them, but you don't promise to love them. You don't promise publicly or within a, you know, within a, a biblical, spiritual sense to love a best friend or anything along those lines. It's a very unique relationship. And in a way, it's kind of like a mini me of the covenant because that's the intimacy that we have with God. And you don't have to be married to be completed. There, you know, marriage, you can be just as lonely in marriage as you are out of it. Again, it's whether you're married or not. I think if you're a believer, you are first married in Christ. You have to take your relation, your decisions, everything to Jesus first. Uh, you know, and that's what I meant when I entitled something like the chapter on the singular life. Like even if you're not married and you're single, um, you know, you still have this singular life in Christ. You're still married if you're a believer. You're still actually in a relationship of intimacy and taking all of your decisions and your thought points and your heart to to Christ first. So I'm certainly all for collecting yourself first in God, having time with, um, to really build that relationship with Christ first. But I would say that anyway, no matter what your earthly status is, Hmm. you should always be doing that. Everyone is going to fall short. Um, we're all sinners and we're all going to fall short of fulfilling each other fully. And again, as Gustin said, you know, um, our hearts are restless until they find their homes in God. And I, I, that's, you know, he's put that longing in to point us to it. We have a re- responsibility to love others based on that first love. And that makes us think differently then about not just our own selves and our own bodies, but also, you know, what are we inflicting on someone else if we're flirting with them and, you know, they are a Christian and in turn, in, in turn they're tempted. Or what if they're not a Christian? What are you, you know, <laughs> what are you doing with their potential to be reached by Christ or to be understand how they're loved fully? How are you loving your spouse in such a way that you're encouraging them to grow in Christ um, just as you are? So again, it goes back to that question Luke had earlier about desires of the self and, uh, you know, and Christians, I, I think I was drawn to Christians because at least they were trying and some, you know, trying has two, is a double-edged word, right? Trying, they can be difficult. <laughs> like I'm dating Jesus. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> but you know but trying like trying the other sense like at least trying we, we we might we're gonna fall short no matter what but there's a world of difference in trying there's a world of difference in thinking wow you know i'm really attracted to this person we're not married yet um you know what happens if i start a catalyst to something that i know is going to go this way is that really the best thing for my heart is that really the best thing for their heart too 
you know, is that the best thing for everybody that's involved with them? We tend not to think about that. And again, that's why marriage, earthly marriage is so important and sacred and safe is because you're marrying each other under God and you're also marrying each other's families and, you know, everything else, all that kind of thing. But it's supposed to be this safe place to grow together mm -hmm. um, and this intimate place where you're allowed to exercise grace up, up front and personal. Um, but that sort of ordering of our love should infiltrate all of our relationships. And at least, at least Christians are trying, you know, I find when people don't have a reference point for God at all, um, it doesn't mean, you know, that they're bad people or, you know, they're not doing something that's good, but, but there's no larger reference point for how they're making those decisions. Then I find it to be quite fair weather, you know, then it's just going to blow in whatever way they feel mm. um, at the moment, instead of having something larger to go to that that obedience sometimes feels like a sacrifice and we're told sometimes it is a sacrifice but it's eyes to see in the dark you know the lord blesses it mm. way out and we might not see it at the time but that faithfulness pays out and um ultimately you know we don't stand at the end of time and go hey what about this guy <laughs> we're answering for our hearts mm. and maybe something that i've had to really work at in my relationship with my husband that i've had to you know look at how I can love him better. Or what's, what am I doing in my own desires for myself instead of shining the light a bit more on him is ultimately good for my heart before God and my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. um, instead of getting so myopic and so focused on the self, which really is the definition of hell really. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you could go a hundred directions with that statement, but that is so, yeah, that's so true. That place of well, and I've, I'm only three years into marriage, but realizing that sometimes the ways in which I'm most pressed to love my wife well is where God is most stretching and exercising and, and improving upon my heart and life. So Absolutely. Wow, thank you for sharing that. And that's why Christians, Christians are cool because <laughs> you know, it. they are cool. I know it because you can, you know, kite high and low. You can talk about the deep stuff and you can talk about the silly stuff. And you can, but you can talk in truth. And that's so much different than what the larger culture hands us. You know, my daughter came, came home a year or so ago from a Shakespeare camp with, they gave everybody condoms, you know, here you're at this camp and, you know, uh, this is going to happen. You're in grade eight or whatever. And after I tried to breathe, <laughs> she's got a good head on her shoulders and, you know, a, a good relationship with God, but still, like you were saying, no reference point though, for something deeper, no, mm. no 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 avail no information to even make a choice of another way mm -hmm. no relational information you know we give kids so much information and no wisdom but no conversation even and christians are open to conversation they're open to at least exploring the truth living something deeper that there is a a, a better way there is a uh, another way and it's richer it is a more abundant life and to not even give people the opportunity to make that decision for themselves or explore it or have the conversations just say hey this is safe sex well that's that's like a, barely a one percent of the hundred percent conversation yeah and um and so I think that's what's so rich and beautiful and cool and exciting about being a Christian is that, you know, at any moment you can even just stop and pray together. I mean, it, it, there's just a whole different way of seeing and being. Yeah. Um, it's not always easy. It's not always convenient. Sometimes you want to put it on the shelf and ignore it um, and, and make some other decisions, but it always, always blesses you out further mm -hmm. and it doesn't just stop with you. And it's, yeah, and it's looking at the the holistic nature of life, whether that's the physical as well as the emotional, as well as, yeah, the spiritual and navigating and journeying through relationships together. And speaking yeah. of, speaking of relationships, uh, you, and you write about this, you referencing uh, TDH, which I understand is tall, dark and handsome, which maybe yeah. a little spoiler alert, if you haven't read the book yet. Um, no, he's now TBH, Luke. He's tall, bald, and handsome. Hey, there. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm TBH as well, but it's joke. it's tall, tall, bright, and handsome because I'm a redhead. So there you go. <laughs> so so you meet you meet your husband TDH yep. now formerly known the man formerly known as TDH. Um, yeah. And um, you have a friend who reaches out to you and asks, "Hey, like, what's the desire of your heart?" And and that's obviously turned out to be a really significant question for you in that moment but I think it's a really significant question for all yeah. of us and so yeah. 
when we think about heart desires coupled with maybe our expectations as well, sometimes of, of others, um, how do those come together in forming relationships, both in desires pointing us in a good direction towards beauty and faithfulness, but also maybe mm. towards, you know, the Hollywood's version of expectations, sometimes threatening the actual caliber of relationships. What are your thoughts on those? Mm, that's such a great question. I think one of the most powerful tools that a Christian has is the question. Hmm. Um, I mean, it's a powerful tool anyway, you know, from te teaching rhetoric, right? It's the most, and, and Jesus uses them all the time, asks people questions all the time. Quest questions have quest at the root because it invites you on a journey. Hmm. And I remember TDH asking me, you know, what is God to you? Who is God to you? And no one had ever asked me that question. And again, it's the same thing we were talking about earlier. No one, you know, they'll send you home with a condom, but they won't say, what does it mean to you to have sex with somebody? Or what does it mean to you to have an intimate relationship? Or, or why are you affronted at the notion that so-and-so, you know, Kim Kardashian cheated on her husband in this way? You know, I'll get mm. students that have a knicker, knickers and they're not over those kind of questions in the media. But yet when I say to them, you know, on a secular campus, well, why would that matter to you? Well, you, you need to be loyal to who you're involved with. Well, why? Like, <laughs> you yeah. know, and asking questions opens this door to thinking about how we're wired or what we believe in or, or even who God is to us. And it's very invitational. And um, I've had many Christian friends, including TDH, as well as a few others, as well as my friend I referred to in the book, um, you know, Christian friends are just the best, but you know, to ask, what is your heart's desire? That's a, that's a huge question. What, what is it locked away in your heart that really is just between you and God? Mm -hmm. um, he's the only one that's going to get fully under your spiritual skin. Uh, he's the only one that can read, you know, the bubble over your head. Uh, thank God. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Especially for those of us who are married, because that would be awkward. But like for any of us, right, you know, he's the only one in that space. And, and, um, he knows what's locked in that little tiny chamber that is so precious and personal. It's the heart that Proverbs, you know, 423 tells us to guard, mm -hmm. you know, to guard that heart because everything you do flows from it. And people think, you know, oftentimes when I interact, especially with secular campuses or students or whatnot, and they'll think, oh, you know, innocence is so trite. It's so silly or, you know, keeping yourself um, for marriage or all these related topics, they're, they're just, they're not, they're out of tune and, and they're not relevant. And, and um, you know, they're, you, if you're innocent, you're just naive. And, you know, it's again, looking at it through the Christian lens, you know, it's, it's absolutely anything but being naive. Mm. Cultivating a pure heart takes a lot of spiritual discipline. Mm. Um, it takes a lot of wisdom. It, it takes a lot of going to God. Um, and I'm not saying necessarily just standing every temptation because really only Jesus does that, but learning from where you have faltered mm -hmm. and from where you've fall fallen short or from what you've taken to prayer in really powerful ways or that really deep conversation that we all know we have, but we don't tell anyone else. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, and it pays it pays forward. And I, like, I remember a powerful story. My, my father-in-law is a pastor. He's a godly man. You know, he has his shortcomings too, but he, when he raised my, my husband who is wonderful, but he's not perfect either. So, you know, I'm not putting like TDH out there as this cheesy thing, but <laughs> mm. <laughs> he's a great guy. But I can, you know, I can remember back when I knew him just as a friend, um, kind of, you know, thinking this guy is not believable, you know, the way that he thinks of sexuality and dating and all of this, yeah, whatever, before I was a Christian. And him saying to me, just pretty honestly, you know, my father really shared this with me. He really modeled this to me. And he also told me, you know, he, that he, you know, he's been praying for my future wife and he's been praying for my heart and he's been praying for the ways that I might not see in the immediate moment, the consequences of my decisions. Mm. And later after we were married, he said to me, sure, there were definitely times I was tempted with you, you know, even as a non-believer when you were and lots of ways. But I kept thinking of my father's voice, actually. I kept thinking of the ways that, you know, I could satisfy immediate things, but what would that do to you? That kind of um, thinking about how uh, we are loving and the, and the consequences of it way out into the future in ways that we can't see. Mm.
Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And you've talked a bit about marriage and in your book, you, you make mention of the fact that you were pretty hesitant uh, to get married, that, that when you were at school, yeah. you, that wasn't like at the forefront of your mind. Um, maybe you can speak to why you felt that way about marriage, but then also uh, if you're willing just to note on what seems so countercultural about Christianity and its view of marriage. Mm. Well, I think I was hesitant, Matt, mainly because of what I went through, you know, growing up. And I, yeah. I, I, uh, I saw a painful marriage between my, my parents for quite some time. It dragged out. They didn't get divorced till I was older, but it should have happened sooner. It was really ugly. And, um, and then I also didn't know a lot of happily married people, let alone Christians. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I knew probably more divorced people than not which I think is really common. And even in Christian circles, you can know people who are Christian and they're committed to the marriage out of commitment. And that's just really like, ugh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm committed to this marriage because I'm committed to God, not you. <laughs> and you're like, okay, let me just like climb out from under that heavy, wet blanket. Yeah. Um, you know, where's the joy in it or where's the commitment? And it's never going to be perfect, but thinking again, going to God, right. For those things. And so I didn't have a model of how it could really work well. I had always been self-sufficient. I was engaged to my college sweetheart when I was a non-believer because we had dated for years and cared very much for each other. It was kind of going to be the next step. You know, I think a lot of times people don't even sort of think of that. So I was kind of open to that. And um, and he was a very, very kind person and a really good person, um, you know, um, a, a committed atheist, but like, it wasn't like I was in a situation of running away from somebody who was violent or anything like that. So when I finally kind of got my feet under me as a Christian, I thought, well, I don't know, like, if I really want to get married, because I don't know, first of all, how this is going to operate. And secondly, you know, I'm enjoying, I enjoy Jesus, not I wasn't dating Jesus, but, <laughs> but, you know, I, I was you. like, you know, that that's great and that's yeah. enough and I actually think I was gifted with a period of time where I I was in love with my husband in a sense of in love with the gospel and with him hmm. um when our friendship became more serious and actually he left I've never thought I was going to see him again and I was gifted with a period of time in my life of several years where we weren't dating we weren't involved I actually was able to really get involved in my church have a whole other life in Christ have fellowship you know um date a few other people that sort of thing which was really a gift in retrospect again you don't always see things but in retrospect gives you a lot of wisdom um and so again i think it's important it really it gave me a sense of who i was in christ first which was an immense gift yeah and you know if i had gotten married that was wonderful if i hadn't gotten married that was wonderful i felt just a real peace with god and in his relationship that i i wanted to pursue more with him and um and I'm really grateful for that. But then as I, yeah, as when it did become more serious with, with my husband and I, and I didn't see that sort of coming, then it, it did end up growing quite quickly because we'd had this really profound friendship um, prior to it, which I really think was a, a, a great gift as well. Yeah. And um, in, in that relationship, um, maybe you can speak to the difference between the relationship that you had coming out of um, when, when you were first engaged to um, maybe even your second engagement or, or your dating relationship throughout that relationship with the man who's now your husband. How did, how did Christ change um, what you knew to be love from that individual, um, but also the love that you were able to give? Mm. Oh, what a beautiful question because I'm really old. I haven't thought of that for a while. <laughs> we, just had, we just had our 23rd anniversary. And after four kids were like, oh, wow, um, we're old and we're tired. That's just perspective. That's great. That's a retrospect you're talking right? about. <laughs> it wasn't the miracle that Sarah and Abraham had the baby. It's that they raised it, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I heard he almost our... killed him. <laughs> I've had moments like that where your kids will push you that far. Um, yeah, you know, I think, again, the Lord knows all of us more intimately than anyone else does. Hmm. 
uh, I mean, again, you can't make this up that he would, you know, we get that white stone of acquittal at the end of time with our name on it that only he knows for us. We all want to be known. I think that's a part of all longing is to be known in some way, um, to be, to know that we're meaningful, to know that we matter, to know that we are beloved runs so deep, deeper than even the Bible stories, but they point to that. Hmm. And I think for me, actually realizing that, yes, I did want to spend my life with this man. And yes, he was the real thing. Hmm. And that he, but he was trying. <laughs> and he was trying with authenticity and that we could at least go to things in prayer together. We could go to things, you know, we have God in our relationship too. Um, I have a sibling, for instance, who became a Christian later, but her spouse is not. And, and you know, that's a whole different space to be in too. Mm -hmm. And equally yoked um, really began to hit me. And, um, and again, it's not a recipe for everything being perfect. Yeah. There's going to be struggles and things ahead, but at least we had that, that beginning point. And I think I was able to start to, I don't even want to say relax, but, but to be purposely and purposefully loved. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, my husband will be the first one to say, I fall short in these many ways, but, and that was a hard one for me to trust. And yet when I saw that he does love me, not because he's in the mood, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. not because, you know, his parents think he should, um, not because the sun is shining today, but because he loves me, but he also really loves me rooted in God and what he says about how, how he is to love me. Yeah. Um, that allows the other person to, to grow and, and to flourish. There's lots of meanings behind the word saved. Mm -hmm. Wow. True say. Carolyn, I wonder, I want to pivot with you a little bit and, sure. and look a little bit at um, women in light of God's sovereign purposes, his redemptive work in the world and, and the role that God often has women, especially in scripture uh, play. And, and you write something, you say in God's economy, arguably the most important roles are played by women. And so I'm intrigued to know, how do you see this play out in both in God's word, but also throughout history? And, and what would you point us to in, in, when you think about the role of women in the church today? Mm, big question. I love the Bible. I, I, when I first read the Bible, I was what I would have deemed myself an academic feminist. You know, um, uh, I mean, I have a very loving big brother that I look up to, but you know, Luke, like I, as I said, I had been fairly disappointed in male figures, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And, and one of the big issues was, you know, well, then if Jesus is a man, oh my goodness, there's more, you know, male chauvinism and this male God and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> fair, fair enough. <laughs> you know, it's like, of course God is male. You know, he rested on the seventh day. I don't know any woman who's rested on the seventh day. Like, you know. Makes sense. He's now not when they're Super Bowl and you're making all the snacks, right? So got you. Yeah, I had kind of this like, hmm. But I think <laughs> I was amazed that even in the time and place that he came into history, where women obviously were second class citizens, women were couldn't even bear testimony, any of those things, and his interactions were women with women were just as profound. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all those questions, oh, why didn't he have 12 female disciples? Well, you know, come on. I mean, it was, he was coming into a certain intersection of time and space, um, you know, that wouldn't have worked and it wouldn't have been expected, but look at my goodness, look at his relationship with his mother and look at his, the, you know, the women he interacts with in the healings and, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, as my sister and I joked about, you know, of course the women, you know, I, I think bore witness to the resurrection because he knew that they would run and talk and tell everybody. <laughs> Very true. It's a great yeah. strategy. Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you want to show the risen Christ and spread the word, you know, tell me and some of my girlfriends, right? After we've had, you know, a glass of wine in a cottage together with a bunch of, you know, on a fun girls night away. We'll tell everybody. Yeah. So <laughs> I think that there's a lot of really, I, I, I never read the Bible going, yes, of course there were horrific stories. I mean, yeah. where, you know, um, 
you know, Abram is pretending Sarah's a sister and, you know, all the undertones to those stories, but, but they're mm -hmm. pun. I mean, God is not saying, Hey, that was a good thing. Right. And, you know, and Adam standing right there when Eve ate, I'm like, you who Adam, <laughs> you know, and again, I think God's showing the extent of the sin and the preference for self that, you know, not only does he not help her, but then he also, you know, blames her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, I didn't feel like there was um, a place in the Bible where women weren't important, even historically for when it was taking place. I was amazed at how interactive women were how much Jesus and interacted with them, how much they were part of these stories. And I think that's still very relevant to us now. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I wouldn't, I, you know, I think that even more so given the time that he was entering in that time and space, it still points to how uh, Jesus is relevant to all of us. Um, and regardless of our, you know, our gender, our societal roles, however we want to say that he, he speaks and heals and interacts with all of us um, in ways that speak to the deep spirit of ourselves. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, Luke and I are our pastors. We're men. Um, we work yes. in a church from a background <laughs> that's uh, complementarian. And uh, I guess a question for you, if, if women do play such an important central role in God's story, not only in the scriptures, but throughout history, um, in, in, your, in your estimation, uh, how can men like us work to celebrate the, the gifts and, and the roles of women in our spaces? Mm. I love you for even asking that question. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> I, I, again, that's an example of a wonderful question, right? A great question, a great invitation. Hmm. Um, because, you know, I think we're, we're always dealing with the pain inflicted um, by all of our sins on everyone at all times. It's always, my husband always says, oh, the fallen world strikes again, hmm. right? With all the ways. And and the relationship between men and women, especially in the church, is a, another example of that. It's just everywhere. And I think, again, just extending grace to each other. Um, men to women, I, I, I personally think, again, speaking to that longing to be loved and to be heard, um, you know, to a woman in your life, both intimately as well as just, um, you know, female friends. I would say that to anyone, um, male or female. But in which I know some of my female colleagues in, in the church or in Christian academia can feel unheard because um, of the biblical tensions or debate right over egalitarian, complementary, and all of that sort of thing. Um, um, I, I, I'm probably a little bit like how C.S. Lewis sidesteps high church and low church in his comments on both. <laughs> I'm, I feel that way a bit myself only because I tend to really be drawn more to the mere Christianity of people, the, the, the heart that Jesus is speaking to, where he might call that person um, in the different ways that they might preach or teach or feel called to follow him. Um, I don't always necessarily think that our gender attributes are, are, uh, are defining attributes before him. Um, but I, I do, there's a lot of power in actually Paul's words of cherishing and respecting. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, being cherished as a woman, and that's not a very popular word, you know, especially post-feminism, um, to cherish. And uh, that can sound really cheesy or, or really powerful word. It really means to, you know, to really love something as it's precious. And um, and I think if we look at the roles, I mean, again, how Jesus even treats his mother, right? We see that even in scripture is, is, is though she is precious and she is. And I mean, that extends to men too, but um, ex women extending respect to men is really powerful. I, I think because we both, we both have power in God and women own so much power to dismantle a man to to break him down to belittle him um we have since the beginning of time and um and uh and so i think that there's a way in which respect thinking about how to respect is a way to formulate um a language of love for women to men as well 
Mm. And, and again, respect can sound so heavy handed and can sound like, you know, you've got to be bow down and well, you know, no one should submit to anybody except Jesus. Mm. <laughs> and then, you know, and then when you're submitting in marriage, you're submitting out of love, um, for that person in that mini covenant. Um, and oftentimes that teaches me more about myself that I need to know than it does for my husband, um, that I need to know about myself before God. But there's a lot, there's, there is beauty and incredible beauty and incredible, um, Christful power in cherishing and respecting. Thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm honestly just thankful. And loving, that, right? Loving, loving, loving. Just loving covers a multitude of things. Right. I'm I'm thankful that you yeah. didn't throw out some uh, almost like concrete tasks that somebody could do to check off on a list to say like, I did it. I did the thing. Um, something like respect or to cherish. Uh, that's something that you can't fake, right? And you know, it's true because, you know, I mean, of course we can all do with, you know, a thoughtful gift that, that that's not necessarily a kitchen item for Mother's Day, you know, all those kind of things, right? All those like bombs we tell men not to step on, you know, um, yeah, it might be nice to get her something romantic, don't get her a blender, you know, all those things. But I'll have to say that what really I love what my husband does is every morning he's an early bird. So he's up ahead of me. I could sleep for my whole life. I'm kind of like a cat. But he's always an early bird. And when I come into the room, he just beams and he, he stands up and he gives me a hug. And I am like the worst person to hug in the morning. My hair is sticking all over and I'm grouchy. I have a, a mug that says coffee first. And like my kids gave me that. That's how bad it is. Like my eight year old wow. gave me that. And I just need to push the button on the coffee. And, and I am like a trudging golem that should live under a bridge and he smiles like i am beautiful and the most precious person in the world and he gives me a big bear hug even though i'm super grouchy and i'm like grumbling how i need to get to the coffee into his shoulder and and he and he'll ask me how did you sleep or were you worrying about this or you know i i saw that you were up or you know he'll ask me something hmm. about my night and, uh, and I had gone through a serious illness a few years ago where he became more in tune with that. But, you know, just that sort of the first thing out of his mouth is about me. Mm -hmm. And um, while I sound really selfish saying that because it should be about me, <laughs> isn't that how we are? you know, there's, there's something to be said, like, instead of him going, wow, babe, you know, maybe you should brush your teeth before you hug me or, you know, something, he just does the bear hug and. And the focus is like, how are you this morning? Mm -hmm. And it just changes my day. Um, and you can have all the feminist or political or propagandist or whatever you want to say words all over the world, but I feel cherished. I feel, I feel loved. I feel known. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I, you know, thinking about how to do that for him, that might not mean the same thing to him, perhaps. Um, what would be a way in which he feels known? That might be a way that I actually have to think about how he might feel known. Right. Um, but, uh, and you know, he knows that about me and he even knows how I take my coffee. <laughs> Those things are the things that speak to you. If I can say anything about the book, the, the regular references to coffee were uh, really <laughs> plus for me. Yeah. It used to be tea when I lived in England, but again, that was before four kids. So now it's more coffee. <laughs> Fair enough. That's great. I think coffee increasingly is God's agency of grace to parents. So yes, that's very true. There you go. There you go. <laughs> hey, uh, Carolyn, this has been a really sweet and valuable time. I wonder in any closing oh, thoughts for us before we land the plane, because I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to pull away from the conversation. You've had such great things to share, but anything you'd want to highlight for us before we, uh, we wrap things up? <laughs> Well, thank you, Luke. I thought I was the only one that said land the plane. I say that to my students when they're <laughs> <laughs> rambling on a paper and I'm like, let's land the plane. Um, no, this is a lot of fun. I appreciate being invited to your table. I appreciate the opportunity for this kind of conversation yeah. um, for my children to participate in your youth ministries or things like them down the road, because I think the more that we can ask each other questions, 
and create a safe environment for that, the more that we can actually explore God's purpose and plan and love and blueprint and care for us um, in, in loving fellowship uh, with each other that's non-judgmental as it's called to be, and that's also um, safe and gracious, it's just a rich way to be. And I really appreciate that you're creating that kind of dialogue for all of us. Well, thank you for contributing to that in a big way today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, Carolyn, just to, as a last note, um, if people are wanting to learn more about you, wanting to get their hands on uh, your writing, uh, how could they learn more about you or get connected with uh, some of the resources you've developed? Um, thank you. Yeah, my, probably the best place is just simply my website, carolynweber.com. You can always email me there as well, um, uh, write uh, at carolynweber.com. And um, I'm sort of old fashioned that way. I try to reply to all of my emails um, in a timely fashion as best as I'm able to do. Sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming, but I do try to re respond personally. Uh, I'm, I do, uh, I'm getting a bit better at social media. My kids are dragging me into this century. <laughs> so I also, uh, I do tweet occasionally. I'm getting a bit better. I do have an author Facebook platform too. And my daughter is about to teach me Instagram. Um, I'm an 18th, 19th century professor, so I'm sort of lame that way, but um, good old fashioned email um, through any of my campus addresses uh, or through my website is fine. Awesome. Right on. Well, hey, well, thank you so much for this time today. We've really appreciated this conversation with you. Thank you. God bless you both.